Uh, thank you, Stomatis. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Milica. This is my colleague, Martin. Uh, <clears throat> we are both data scientists at Incube. Uh, Incube is a technology and consulting company offering uh, services in intelligent digitization. And uh, in order to do that, we also use machine learning. Our team focuses on data science. Uh, and so today I will tell you about how we use machine learning and autoencoders uh, to deal with data quality. Uh, let me first tell you, uh, uh, give you a short overview of our talk. So first of all, I will uh, talk about data quality today, how it is done today, and what are the issues. Uh, then Martin will talk about how we can use autoencoders to overcome these issues. And finally, <clears throat> Uh, he, he will show a demo also. And then finally, I will give you an overview of uh, our most important findings. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, data quality today. Um, we have three sides to it. Uh, on the one side, we have data entry, data uh, calculation, data consolidation. On the other side, we have uh, data quality. So we have people who, uh, who think about potential data errors that could appear, and they code SQL rules uh, that could detect these errors. And then finally, we have um, the end user, so a person who uh, uses the data after it has been checked to, <clears throat> to do various calculations, to make reports, to analyze the data, and so on. Uh, so the process goes like this. Uh, we get some batch of data. Uh, this data gets checked, and then uh, we get the results back. The data, the, the data batch is fine. Uh, this means the end user can use it, and this process is repeated for all the batches. Uh, so now, <clears throat> uh, all this time while, while this is happening, new data is arriving. Uh, the, the guy on the right, so the, SQL, the, the data quality manager, uh, he needs to uh, keep track of errors that appear, come up potentially with new rules, and the process goes on. What can happen is we can have a batch of data with some errors, and hopefully these errors will be detected. <clears throat> uh, what's the process then? The process is somebody needs to fix them, somebody needs to do uh, error remediation or fixing. Um, afterwards, it's hopefully going to be fine, the user can use it. Uh, this goes on, and what can also happen is that we can have bad data uh, with errors that uh, go undetected. So that's because maybe the, the guy on the right um, couldn't code these rules, or he, <clears throat> or, or just maybe, maybe he forgot, or whatever. Uh, and if this gets labeled as good, uh, and the end user uses it, well, the whole process takes some time and is not maybe the most reliable, so this can make our analyzer may be a bit unsatisfied. Uh, so to summarize this, we have uh, manually coded SQL rules. That's the situation that we have today. And in the good case scenario, we also have some um, univariate statistical checks, maybe. Uh, the issues with these, there are several issues. First of all, uh, it is hard uh, to establish and maintain a comprehensive set of rules. Uh, secondly, um, there are... Um, errors that potentially go undetected because they are maybe, it is very, very unlikely that we will capture all the errors with our rules. Um, thirdly, um, uh, sorry, thirdly, the, uh, the focus is too narrow. This means that um, <clears throat> multivariate dependencies among data sometimes are not exploited with these rules. Um, and lastly, um, with SQL rules, if we have not coded some, uh, some type of error, it can take a while uh, until this error causes some significant damage that we figure out, ah, there is an error there, we, we have to consider this. So it is only detected after occurrence. Um, so the solution we propose is using machine learning, at, and this solution addresses these challenges in following ways. So first of all, automation. Uh, the errors are detected simultaneously as the model runs. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> uh, reusability of models. So the models are uh, tailored to specific data types, and they can then, uh, after 
after the, the, the model pipeline is set up, they can, they can be reused for fields of the same or similar uh, type. And last but not least, uh, uh, the multivariate interdependencies between data fields can be exploited, so this is very important. Uh, the way we propose to do this is by using uh, autoencoders. Autoencoders are unsupervised models which uh, model their own input data, and uh, because this input data is uh, also the output, uh, the anomalies are detected easily as the minority, and autoencoders can also capture multivariate relationships. So now I will hand it over to Martin, who will explain to you how autoencoders work. Yeah. I would like to talk a bit about uh, autoencoders and how they can be used for data quality management. So what is an autoencoder? Basically, an autoencoder is a neural network, and as such, it has an input and an output. And the target of an autoencoder is to reproduce the input using the output. So we have a certain set of nodes here as input and the same number as output, and we want to reconstruct it. Now, that might not seem like a difficult task, but uh, what autoencoders usually are faced with is some constraint. We introduce a bottleneck in the middle. We usually have fewer nodes, so we introduce a bottleneck either by architecture in, 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 by limiting um, the number of nodes in the hidden layers of the neural network, or we introduce regularization on the autoencoder. For instance, L1 regularization forces some coefficients to become zero, and in the end, we have this bottleneck that limits the dimension of the data representation in the hidden layers. So in order that the autoencoder can still reproduce the input data, it has to make use of the structure of the input data. It has to use the structure to be able to reconstruct it again out of this limited information. So how do we use this for data quality? Um, here, training comes in because we want to happen this reconstruction of the input to happen for good data only. So we have our data. We want to train an autoencoder on it, and it should only reproduce the input for good data points. So what does that mean for training? First of all, we have an unsupervised training here. We get the data points without labels. So we don't know in advance which data points are bad and which are good. We train on all of the data points. So to ensure that the neural network learns only the structure of the good data, we require the share of good data to be large. For instance, how much good data you need depends on the subtlety of the errors that you're trying to find. But as soon as you have like 90% good data, you, you have a chance to, um, to work with autoencoders. It also has a consequence. It limits the potency of the network. Often in neural networks, if you want to improve the model, you add more layers to it, make it more powerful, and then use more computational power to train it. This does not work here because then the autoencoder will use this additional power to learn to also re reconstruct the bad data in the input. And this is precisely what we don't want to happen. So we use usually ve also very simple architectures and focus more on the training, like for instance, when we stop training the autoencoder. So we have a wide a variety of, of neural networks that we use, simple one-layer ones like the one is shown here, and also more complicated like variational autoencoders for sequence data types like names. So how do we now make this distinction between good and data points on that side? How do we measure that? That is the next topic. What we first do is we look at some sample data points that we also trained on and we plot them their reconstruction error. Often you can just take the mean squared error, there are different choices, but what you get in the end is a, is a plot like that, where you have individual data records, and they're class, they're, we have two classes. But notice that this coloring here into good and bad data is for visualization only. So the training of the autoencoder happens in an unsupervised way where we don't provide these labels. And as you can see, we want to separate the bad data points from the good data points, but the challenge here is that we have a large number of data points and potentially extreme class imbalance. So we have maybe just a few errors in our data, but a lot of good data, which is actually the good case. 
So what we use to do this is to perform a simple kernel density estimate of this reconstruction error. So the errors above here are fewer and the, the ones below are bigger. And if we want to separate the two, we try to find the minimum of this kernel density estimate here and then use this and plot a line between these two sets of data points. And this is what the outer encoder then labels as good and bad data. So one challenge here is that the magnitude of the reconstruction errors varies a lot. So you have not just one type of error in your data, but several types. It could be missing, for instance, a data point, which will give a, a large error here, or it can be malformatted, which would be, mean a less severe error. So in order to still be able to, to learn on that data, um, we had to come up with a solution of that problem because we couldn't just make a powerful model that learned both of it, because a more powerful model would learn to represent, represent the bad data as well. So what we did in the end is do an iteration of models. We take a first model, we see what type of errors it detects, we remove those errors, and we keep the rest of the data. And then we repeat the process, we zoom in, we train another model, and apply it to that data, and we continue this process until we get a picture like this, where we cannot separate some small amount of data in uh, using the reconstruction error, and here we say we stop the process. So this can be automated, this, uh, this process, and we can also increase the complexity of the model in these iterations because we remove one of the more severe errors in the steps before. And we have a stopping criterion when we say that the data, that the data says that there are no more errors. I would like to show you a, a little video demo of how this works and what to see a, a bit of example data to see um, how this approach, what it can detect and what not. So here we have sample data which resembles a bit the data that uh, we used in our project. We had a project where we applied this on production data. And in this sample, but this is just sample data, and we have customer relationship data here, for instance, two types of customers. They can be either companies or private people. And we, for instance, want to look at the birth date of customers. And if we train the model, then we'll see some reconstruction errors uh, pop up here and see that there are two errors. If we filter the table, we see that it is a company which has a birth date and a private customer without a birth date, which are two maybe very severe errors. But we can also do more subtle errors, for instance, introducing a customer who is born in the 19th century and thus too old to be still alive with high plausibility, or someone born in the future. And we'll see that these two reconstruction errors of these data points, they go above the line, are detected as errors. So this was a data type of uh, a data of type date, but we can also use textual data like first names. If we look at this example of first names, we see that also here we have a, an error. And if we look at the table and see what type of error it is, it's maybe not that that uh, realistic here this uh, this annotation, but we, we we saw similar annotations in production data. And uh, also, if we, for instance, introduce a title to uh, turn Georgia Kingsley into Mrs. Georgia Kingsley, then we'll also see that this is detected as an error. And uh, notice that this is just because in the training data we didn't have this occurring. So um, this is not part of the model specification. This is part of the training, this result. As a last example, we look at a numeric data. For instance, we can model the revenue of companies. And when we plot the whole thing, we expect a roughly a linear relation between the number of employees of a company and its revenue. But this, re this uh, relation is not a strict linear relation, but just roughly. And we can try and see that how, how this autoencoder works on those. So they are separate models, to be clear, like for, for these three. We have a, a, a data point that's found as an error, and this is a company with only one employee, but a large revenue. So um, here we have an employee, an, an error in the employee column. And if we also disturb this linear relation, for instance, by making the employee, uh, the revenue large or the number of employees large, 
we should see an error, but we shouldn't see an error when we just change the relation a little bit. And this will also be reflected in this continuous uh, error here. There I see two data points that are singled out, but a third data point where we just uh, tweak the, the relation a little bit, which is rightfully not detected as an error. So I hope you, you could get a little uh, an impression of how uh, what type of data we work on and how the modeling works. And uh, now I would like to hand back to my colleague Milica to summarize the findings of the project that we did. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, so now, finally, I will give you a short summary of the lessons learn, uh, learned in this project. Uh, first of all, reusability. Reusability gets its own slide. Um, we built uh, pre-processing and modeling pipelines uh, that are based on the, on the field type. So for each type of, uh, of the SQL fields, we have, uh, we have specific pre-processing that we do and uh, model that we choose, model architecture. Uh, <clears throat> this is very uh, generic, uh, which means it can easily be applied to a new field. So for example, once uh, we build a model for a date of birth, which Martin showed, uh, for, the, for that one, we do uh, extraction of numerical features from digits and then some normalization, and then we use complete regularized autoencoder. Auto uh, once we have built this for one date, uh, we can just apply it to a new field that comes that is also of this type, for example, um, date of opening the account or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this setup is, has a reusability as one of the key uh, plus sides, so to say. Uh, now, the other uh, big takeaways from this project um, are the following. So first, from the training process, uh, the important thing is that autoencoders are unsupervised models. So this means that the, the quality of the training data really matters. We don't expect to have 100% good data and then train. And then once the bad data comes, it is detected because it's new. But uh, you cannot have 50-50. If you have 50% of errors, they will not be detected as anomalies. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> uh, the f so we work closely together with subject matter experts because we need to get feedback from them about whether our models are uh, sensible, whether, whether they produce good results. Uh, and the last part is the reusability, which I mentioned. So it is a one-time one customization effort for the pi pipelines, for building the model pipeline. But then in the, after that, it can be uh, reused. <clears throat> uh, now, the findings about uh, performance of the models. Uh, the models were able to uh, re recreate or uh, detect, again, all the errors that were detected also by the SQL rules, which is very good. But what's even better is that these models were able to find <clears throat> Uh, new errors, which have not been detected by the SQL rules. And how we find this out is we get some error candidates, and then we let the subject matter experts uh, give us their feedback check. And then they say, oh, yeah, that is indeed an error. <clears throat> and the last finding is that our models, as you could see, for example, with revenue, the last example that Martin showed, they also detect uh, multivariate dependencies. Uh, and the last point I want to make is uh, the future endeavors, <clears throat> so potential future enhancements of the project that we worked on. Uh, there are three points. One is we would like uh, to improve our models over time, uh, so see what are the good errors that we, what are the actual errors that we detected, and what are the false positives, and how we can deal with them. Uh, the next point is we want to do batch processing, so not just detect errors in single data points, but in the whole batch of data, and this way we can um, detect uh, uh, data sources that are faulty. And the last point uh, that we would like to focus on in the future is we would like to do uh, error remediation using uh, robotic process automation and intelligent process automation. So not just automated error detection, but also correction. Uh, so that would be all from us. Thank you very much for your attention. I will leave the slide here if you have any questions. That's just a summary slide of everything. Thank you.